All right, guys, we are here with the very special edition of, it's going to be, call it a podcast, call it a training. It's going to be a multi-purpose uh, format here. Uh, and I'm here with some uh, really good friends. Uh, I've been talking to them more than I talked to my wife these last couple of weeks and months. Uh, Spencer Viernes and Nash Foster, thank you for being on with us today. And we're broadcasting to our audience out there, everybody from our IX Brand Ambassador community, uh, who are in independent business owners and then people that are just getting the message of decentralization that's kind of what i want to kind of focus on today is you know this concept of decentralization in the technology space really came about call it a decade ago um, you know with the little white paper out there we don't really know who wrote it but they created peer-to-peer -peer transactions of bitcoin right and then since then we've seen all these other Things pop up and the, the community knows it as cryptocurrency mostly, but there's underlying technologies. But I think the concept of decentralization can be, doesn't have to be associated with blockchain per se. And so I want to kind of talk about some of those things, but just to introduce these guys here really quickly, um, I actually met Spencer probably about a couple months ago now, and we're looking to put together a, uh, a deal that we're going to talk about here in a, in a few minutes, but um, really got to know Spencer. He got introduced to me. I hope it's okay to say this as a lawyer. Um, and just don't hold it against no. me. And, and he has been amazing and just all the information and knowledge that he has about the technology space, about data centers, about software, cloud businesses. And then from Spencer, I had the privilege and opportunity to meet Nash. And I remember the first time we walked into the restaurant, I was like, okay, I really didn't know who we we're going to meet. And I was with a friend of mine and we were in my car and I'm like, I just told these guys I drive an F-150 and then we walk all the way up to my other car, <laughs> say what it is. I was like, <laughs> I wonder what these guys really think about me. So, um, but I got to know Nash and his partners over the last few you know, weeks and just the amount of, I guess, information that you guys have, this industry specific information, I'll call it for what we want to stand up here with CloudX has been just absolutely eye-opening. And I kind of want to take the opportunity to introduce you guys and just, we'll just kind of have a conversation and uh, for lack of a better terms, geek out on some technology stuff here and the people can just listen in. So right, thank on. you guys for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I guess with all that out of the way, you know, um, my whole concept of the way I've built my company um, is based on the concept of decentralization. I think democratizing industries and being able to give back to the people, empowering the people uh, is something that blockchain technologies lends itself to. It just is misunderstood right now in governments and maybe they're threatened a little, but that's a whole other conversation. But um, I am getting out of a business that was blockchain related, but the messaging of decentralization at its core is I think something that in the developer space, the technology space has been at its core, right? Because that's basically where it came from. So I guess the first question I have is, you know, what are your thoughts of, you know, decentralization as a whole, not just in the blockchain community, but, you know, we've had great conversations on this and um, I don't know if you want to take that first. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, and, and, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll see if m my thoughts are aligned with how Nash thinks about this. But, <laughs> hey, if they're not, um, it's okay. You know, it's interesting. Decentralization, and I think it's fair that you mentioned it has many roots in the software and software development space. Um, but I think that it is expanding significantly beyond that. I, as you mentioned, I, I've worked across a number of different technology sectors. And even when we look at power, right? So, you know, the story that I like to tell about how I got into data centers was I was a real estate lawyer and got hired by a technology company and they introduced me to it. Um, and what I realized, one of the most significant things that I realized as I was introduced to what I call digital infrastructure now is there's so much power, there's so much infrastructure that's developed to support that, supports what we have as the internet today, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that power, electrons, right? Electricity, um, heat. That, that's the biggest thing that separates us in Western Europe, in North America, from everywhere else on the planet. And with reliable power, you can build everything else. Mm -hmm. um, 
the issues that we run into, and we even run into that now here in North America, is that when you have significant centralization, at a certain point, you get to the place where it is really difficult to do more. So you know, whether it's um, software and what we talk about with respect to currency or artificial intelligence or even just power, right? Um, trying to get power to people's houses is harder and harder now because you know, there's more land that people own. And so um, that's a big component as to like the fundamentals that, and how I see decentralization is it's being able to distribute those resources so that they can be used more efficiently. And because we have the technology to do so, we don't necessarily have to be tied to a centralized control mechanism, right? Or a centralized governance body in order to efficiently use those resources. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that's... Um, that, that, may be the, that may be the only time you hear that. I was just going to say that. That might be the first time I ever heard him say that. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I've got some gray on my beard. I got on the internet in 1993, right? And in the beginning, the internet was really decentralized. And, um, you know, most people didn't get on and, you know, didn't, didn't start using the internet until the late nineties or early two thousands. Uh, and the, all the growth, you know, the massive growth has all happened in the last 20 years really. Uh, but, the but the ethos of the early internet was totally decentralized, right? Like if you wanted to run a website, you bought a server, you found an ISP, you found a data center, you put it there, you, brought it up yourself, you, you know, you'd have to know how to run the software for the web server and all this kind of stuff because you, there was nobody that was going to help you do it. <clears throat> and for sure, the internet's become easier to use as central services have made, you know, bringing up web space point and Convenience click. Convenience like, tools. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but I think what we're starting to see are that the costs of centralization in terms of you know, privacy and speech and the ability to do business globally without interference and, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. These costs are really significant and people are starting to go, I wonder if this was really worth it. And um, the good news is that we're beginning to have the software to go back mm -hmm. so that we can maintain the convenience that we have today while returning to, you know, an internet where the architecture is a lot more distributed, a lot more decentralized. Um, and uh, uh, that, that that this can really, you know, like put a lot more different kind of power, but put a lot more power back in the hands of people who, you know, own their own stuff. And I think that's one of the reasons that I've really, I remember our first conversations is just like that message can resonate with a lot of people out there. And it doesn't have to be people in the blockchain space. It's just software developers. It, it can be just about anybody. And I think everybody around the world has so, at some point in their time run into a problem where, hey, I could easily fix this, but I'm not allowed to. Um, and I think that's where we're at right now is we as a community, my community here at IX, we've been, you know, we've been putting out this message of, hey, we want to empower the people. How do we give back to the people? You start looking at all the messages out there on and I'm not trying to get political or anything here, but, you know, you, you see people like that are very vocal, the Elon Musks of the world, and he gets attacked all the time for his kind of views by politicians say, hey, well, if he just donated all his money, we could fix world hunger, right? Like there would be no start. And we all know that's not true because when you give something to somebody, they don't learn anything on it, right? You give somebody a fish, you're going to have to give them a fish the next day and the next day and the next day. But when you can teach somebody to fish or to hunt or to provide for themselves, then you can really empower them. And I think obviously there's a lot of great people out there. I use Tony Robbins as, as an example because he has this mission, this personal mission to, you know, do like 10, a billion meals or something like that. And yes, he's doing a lot of good for people out there. But again, next year, it's going to now need to be $2 billion or 2 billion, you know, mills. And, and if we could teach some of these people in places like Africa and Ghana or in India or Latin America, and those are the people that I'm thinking about with this message is how do we empower them to go and provide for themselves, right? Yeah. The average income outside of the U.S., you know, $200 a month. And so $2 a day is like, imagine trying to live on $2 a day here in the U S it would be really hard. And so like decentralization, what it, 
and the technology, whether it's blockchain related or not, there's softwares out there where, look, you purchase something, I can tie it to you, I can compensate you for it. Um, and that's where this message, that's where this messaging really started, right? Can we create something that's already in the traditional sector, um, in the technology space that can be automated and that can democratize or decentralize technology? And, and we started developing this concept and we came up, you know, there's some branding behind us, CloudX, and it's decentralizing the cloud, empowering the people around the world. And let's talk about that. Like you guys have been in, you know, the, the data center business from the real estate side to the infrastructure, that's electricity and, and the buildings, hardware. And Nash, I learned something. I think it might have been, sorry, I might be confusing who I learned it from, but I le I've been learning a lot these few weeks and it's, you know, the infrastructure side of things, but you have the hardware and on top of that, you have the software and that's the cloud. So let's talk a little bit about the cloud and what's happened to it over the last 10 years and who's taken advantage of the cloud business these last 10 years. Yeah. 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 I mean, the history of the cloud is, you know, when, when kind of the, the internet arose as, as Nash says, you had you had large enterprises, large companies then, and they wanted to take advantage of that. And then you started to see some of these technology companies coming up, right? You've got Google or you've got Facebook that began, and they began in Microsoft that was a player in, in applications that you ran on your computer even maybe before the internet was significantly um, uh, present or prevalent in our lives, right? And And because of their positions, they were able to kind of start to centralize some of the control around how we access and how we utilize the internet, right? Um, and and now, I mean, cloud has become such a big thing. We're so familiar with Amazon or with Google Cloud or, or these providers of cloud because they came from large businesses. Cloud wasn't their first business, right? Google started in search. Amazon started in the, you know, everything store, frankly, selling college Book textbooks, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and they started to move into this because they saw the advantage in where we were going with what we call digital transformation, right? Um, and they were able to centralize those efforts because they had the revenue and they had the bankers backing them. Um, what's really interesting about cloud and the ability to look at infrastructure and software layered on top of that to provide the cloud is, and um, as you've mentioned before, right now you can you can look at how you automate and how you um, – I guess, virtualize the physical machines that compute things or store data, um, and you can make that accessible. Um, what has often been a big issue, and this is why those big companies got into cloud and were able to start to centralize control, um, not just across cloud, but across several types of applications that people across society have used, is they just had the money to begin with. Yeah. They had more money and yep. they were disposed in that predisposed in that direction. Well, and during the the big expansion of cloud over the last 10 years, um, not only did they have cash, but they had access to financing yeah. at extremely preferential terms, right? So they've yeah. been able to borrow the money from giant banks in New York at, you know, two, two and a half, three percent, um, and uh uh you know use that to finance the expansion of their operations in a way that, you know, it's not available to, you know, a guy that's doing $10 million in his right. tiny little data center. And, right. you know, even, even if he has a better, you know, better run business at that scale than somebody else, he, it's not like he can go to the bank and he can, you know, borrow the next hundred million that he needs right. to build yeah. the next right. step up. Right. Um, yeah, that's and exactly uh, right. yeah, so that's, I mean, and, I think this is one of the interesting places where you have infrastructure, software technology, and then financial technology in the world of cryptocurrency. And these are all kind of coming together to help, you know, break apart the, the control of the central, you know, the central banking, the traditional finance, um, you know, centralized technology companies like Google and Amazon, um, and, to, you know, to, to create opportunities for, you know, individuals to participate in projects that, you know, can accomplish a lot more than those individuals could accomplish on their own. And yeah. that's really powerful. Yeah. Because that's, it's the most exciting thing that's happened on the internet in 
25 years, I think. Yeah. And, and so that's, you know, it's certainly why I'm still doing yeah. this. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's it's a, a great, great point. point. I heard a, I've heard this quote a number of times. Um, and I hear it, um, I've heard it several times recently, you know, talent, um, is not unevenly distributed, but opportunity is. And, you know, to the point that Nash made, you might have someone who has a data center, you know, has some millions of dollars, but it's not nearly on the scale as some of these really, large really large tech yeah. corporations. Yeah. Um, and the other data point that's worth noting there is, you know, uh, among facilities that are identified as data centers globally, there's like 7 million. Wow. 7 million. I mean, and, and those aren't just data centers from these big tech companies. They're small facilities all around the globe that have a particular set of kind of specifications that allows them to be qualified as data centers. The notion of decentralization, whether you're talking about financial technology or power distribution or even the software automation to be able to tie that fabric of assets and opportunities together enables each of those smaller players in a larger pond to increase the weight that they carry as they move throughout that, that sphere. And, and that's really part of what, you know, what your vision is and, and what we can enable. It's, it's, it's a really amazing thing because you're also leveraging assets that otherwise won't be able to see their highest and best use necessarily as they compete in the same market as these larger tech corporations because they don't have that weight. They don't have that community to join together with and, 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 and utilize. Yeah. And I think that's probably the the biggest thing that I've understood is in community building, right? Is like if you have a large enough group of people, you can, and they're organized, you can do anything. You could go out and we were just talking about raising some, you know, a billion dollars for X, Y, Z real estate project. It's like if you have the people, everybody can contribute a little bit and it becomes something big. And um, that's what the power of decentralization has brought. But then you can democratize industries like the cloud. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you guys saw when we first kind of started talking about this message of, and, and I know you guys might have two different views here, view from the infrastructure side and maybe from the software side, but what are some of the views that you guys see as far as like, why could this business be successful? Um, as successful, or even I think, we, even if it was a mediocrely successful cloud, like how big could that be, and why could the messaging help build this business? Right, I guess is is the, is the question yeah. I'm trying to get to. So I'll maybe less on the infrastructure side. I'll, I'll I've you know so in, in my career I've I've been around a lot of different industries. So as a lawyer helping folks and then going into the tech side and doing data centers. And um, I, I actually started moving more and more away from just the legal side in my career and started doing more of business operations and strategy. And I've done everything from, you know, restructurings where you have a company that, you know, can't pay its bills. It's essentially bankrupt and you work with them to figure out how they can get back on their feet. And sometimes with a bankruptcy, sometimes outside of the bankruptcy court. Um, and, and even looking at startups and trying to start a new venture where you've got to raise money so that you can actually get the business going. Um, and, and that's probably a good place to look at the distinction um, here. Because when you have a community and you know, th there are opportunities and obviously there are compliance requirements with everything. Um, and you can, you can address those. Um, but there are opportunities to look at how you can avoid the typical slog of trying to go to a venture capital firm and see if they believe in you and your team and if they want to vet your technology and months and years to do that, right? All I the mean, due diligence and the yeah. rejection. And it's just, it's a hard process to go through. I've yeah. done it. You know, it's easy to talk about unicorns and say like, look, venture capital is going to be it. If you got technology, you're going to go. You know, the average group, I mean, it's years before they see real success and, and sometimes even years before they see any real money just to try to get going. And so the way that you can utilize community to look at um, 
capitalizing that infrastructure footprint that's necessary so that you can util- so you can put the software on it and really automate how you scale your business it really makes a significant it's a material distinction and advantage for what you're doing in the community and then you know just looking at the economics of the cloud business generally if you look at many of the major reports whether you're looking at you know the major private equity groups, or you're looking at the major industry and financial analysts that are looking at the industry as a whole, the acceleration of the cloud services and cloud compute industry is just staggering. And, and, you know, we saw, so, you know, I'll give you an example um, that maybe isn't a direct corollary, but probably kind of speaks to where we're going, right? So, you know, your, your, your web um, or your traditional enterprise businesses it took years and years and years to get 100 million customers, right? And then Facebook, which is something that everybody knows of, months and months and months and 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 a long time to get that. And ChatGPT was like five days, something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was something the crazy. Million users in the first month. Yeah, I mean, it was just it, like like a hundred million users. I mean, it was crazy yeah. the growth that they're seeing with what they're doing and all of that is sitting in a data center, um, sometimes with cloud providers or not, but that's all going to be deployed across the cloud. And and not only that, that's only one component, but the other cloud businesses that were even existing before AI, right, before AI came on with ChatGPT, they were still growing at 25 to 30% a year mm-hmm. in the hundreds of billions of dollars of profit. So, like, there's, there's so much space as... We see people and societies across the globe using digital products in their everyday life, right? You know, like we, it used to be the case that people wouldn't pay their rent, but they would pay their cable bill, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's, they will pay for their phone service. And that's where everything, that's where we get so much of what we do. Yeah. I traveled around the world and I'm like surprised they won't have a roof over their head, literally, but they'll have a smartphone. And so that's what technology has done to us as a society as a whole. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, living on $2 a day or $200,000 a day. It's like everyone's going to have that smartphone right now. That's how prevalent technology is in our lives. That's right. And, and the activity that you conduct on that smartphone, whether you're paying or whether your data is being sold to somebody and they're paying that that activity that you're that you're doing through that smartphone that's generating trillions of dollars in revenues for for, for a variety of different companies and they don't always have your best interest in mind now imagine if having a smartphone and owning a slice of the infrastructure and owning a slice of the software and being a participant in a decentralized cloud means that your activity on the smartphone is actually putting money back in your pocket Right? So the more you and the community all use the technologies that you've built together, the more that you earn as a result of, of being you know, in on the ground level. The, the, this, this is an incredibly powerful advantage because the next project that, that community wants to do, now all of a sudden everybody that participated in the first one gets to participate more at the next level. right? And, and so there's this snowball effect that I think can happen with – um, with decentralized projects that it's very hard. You know, one of the things about, I'll give you the story about Google. Um, I was there for a number of years and, and um, at, at one point, uh, you know, the, I, I ended up talking to one of the lawyers that was in charge of like dealing with all the cash that they had, which was just humongous piles of it, t- yeah. tens of billions of dollars in cash. That, and, and he said, you know, the, the, the biggest problem is we don't know what to do with all of this money. We don't have enough good ideas to spend the money on that. You get a million people together, the ideas are going to come, yeah. right? And they're going to figure out, you know, what projects look good, what projects look exciting, and they're going to do it in a way that matters to them, right. right? They're not going to do it in a way that's mediated by, you know, the project approval and budgeting process inside of some mega corporation that doesn't care about what your interests are. They're going to do it based on what they want, what they want to do and how they want the world to be. And now it's going to be the vision of millions of people working together 
that defines what the next version of the internet's going to look like. And that, yeah. that's so exciting, right? Well, and it's kind of funny. So I have two thoughts on some of the things that you guys said. Number one is for, I learned from my mentor, you can only split up a dollar so many ways, right? So you can only redistribute it so many ways. And one of the great things about the industry that I've been in the last decade plus has been you really get to design compensation-based models to reward behaviors, like you were just talking about, reward behaviors of, of or incentivize behaviors you want to reward. Sure. Now, it same thing is like, man, I think of I was just envisioning $10 billion in cash. Like, how could that improve the bottom line of people around the world? And it could imp- like their bottom line could improve the bottom line of society as a whole if they had the right way to correlate it. And I get it, a business like Google wants to go and make money and they obviously have shareholders that they're responsible to. But it's like, why can't we create something that's going to leave the world a better place at the same time? And yes, they do that through charities. And But there ha- like we got to start teaching people to do or incentivizing the right skills or incentivizing the right behaviors because, you know, we live here in the U.S. and everybody wants to come here, but there's not enough room for everybody to be here. But that doesn't mean we cannot create the same level of opportunity around the world in India where they're very tech savvy and a lot of great developer development teams are out there. And um, Latin America, same thing. Africa has some of these the best resources, natural resources in the world untapped right now. I was just out in Ghana a few last year, but like you said, they don't have the in, the the they don't have the power, the electricity, or the iron ore, or the, right. the they don't have that infrastructure to become a industrial powerhouse to become then a technology powerhouse. They're just lagging behind a few decades, um, but they have the natural resources. But there's just so much, and I hate to use the word corruption. You know, like there's just so many people with their hands in the pot because everybody's just trying to get out of the situation they're in and nobody's lifting them up. So I guess with all that said, um, the, the, let's, let's talk about, I I know I keep saying this, but let's talk about the data center. Like let's talk about some of the things that we're doing here, right? We're talking high level stuff. Let's talk about some of the things we're doing here. Um, so, you know, Spencer, you've come in and, and, um, really kind of opened my eyes to what, data centers are supposed to be, what they're supposed to look like, how they're supposed to perform. Um, and all of the, I get a little frustrated sometimes because I'm like, man, I, I don't care if the car hits the building. Like, what's that going to do if that happens or if there's a, a battery laying on the ground over here? I'm like, let's just start do this so we can start making money. Yeah. But I, and then you explain it out and it makes sense. And um So there's a lot of things that go into this business that we'll probably never even really realize or know about because people always want to be connected. And I think that's one thing that people, we take for granted, right? Is this all this connectivity with instant messaging, phones, it all runs off of the cloud these days. And all of that infrastructure and software is, has to run off of power. And all of those things we have to think about before we even start this business here. So you've built out all these models on the financial modeling side and then Nash, you and Rusty went in and we, Rusty's not here right now, but um, I'm sure we'll get him on soon. But <laughs> I have to add to mention him real quick, but, you know, on the hardware spec side and then yeah. being able to bring everything together to actually run a cloud business, yeah. it's been, you know, months and months of planning before we were even able to meet Nash. And then Nash, you guys have been at it for a few weeks now, a couple of weeks here trying to figure things out. And I know I'm pushing you guys very, very hard, but I think there's this opportunity to really take everything that we've talked about and distribute those profits that would have gone to a Amazon or a Google where they have these $10 billion in cash just sitting there back to the people like directly back to the people. And I think that's just an amazing, like we take $10 billion, like how many people's lives could we impact? And I I get get this, uh, there's a big opportunity there in my eyes. Yeah, there's huge margins in the cloud business, right? The, I mean, what Spencer was saying earlier before the, before the podcast, Microsoft spends $10 billion every quarter on infrastructure upgrades. And, 
that's because there's so much margin in the Azure cloud that they run that that $40 billion a year is a reasonable price tag to keep it up to date and keep it running and keep it reliable and expand it to the extent that they need to. Um, and, you know, when they're order, when they go to NVIDIA and they order the A100 AI GPUs now, the size of the order is measured in tons, not even in number of cards. They're just like, we want a hundred tons of, <laughs> of GPUs. And, you know, it's, it's what we're, you were saying their uh, power requirements just to light those up. Oh yeah, it, it's it's a bit it, it, it's astronomical, honestly. So to give you a sense of scale, you know, if you have a ten megawatt data center, right, which is not that big anymore, but a ten megawatt data center is something like seven thousand homes of power, right? Um, the typical data center now is going to be 100 to 200 megawatts. So they take as much power as small cities. Microsoft and Meta were the two largest purchasers of NVIDIA GPUs for orders to be shipped within the next 18 to 24 months. They ordered enough GPUs. This is in addition to their existing fleets, right, of data centers. They ordered enough GPUs that would require 9 gigawatts of power. Nine gigawatts of power is more than some countries, more than many states in the United States. I mean, it's it's such a significant amount of power. I, I don't even have some, a frame of reference to give you. Yeah. <laughs> and if we think the cost of centralization in the age of Google search and you know Microsoft applications and Amazon's everything store, if we think centralization cost us a lot, then. Right. Imagine what it's going to cost us when we're spending all our time interacting with an AI and it could tell us what to think. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's in control of like what information we have access to and what kinds of questions we can even ask about the world that's around us. Mm -hmm. Right now, in, in, in that world, when the AI is controlled by three companies or five companies, right, there's I don't know how you have I don't even know how you have democracy anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know how you do reasonable governance anymore because the entire, you know, the entire perception of the world that people are going to have is going to be controlled by these tech companies. And this is why, you know, open AI went from being, you know, a cup worth a couple of hundred million dollars to being worth Billion. what was a hundred billion dollars was the value or more was and the valuation. What's, what's last the revenue? Race. Do you guys know the revenues on <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm just I saying I, uh, I pay them, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, the valuation is just, it's, it's crazy because it's, it's because of the opportunity moving forward because of the potential yes. maybe controls and, and, right. and the ways that you could market the ways that you can influence consumers to be able to purchase more or that's right. Double their purchasing at your, you know, so there's a lot of things. I, I, and we haven't seen anything yet, I, right? Like, like that's oh, a scary part. Yeah, just, just so you know, it's this super is scary. Not being political. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, decentralization is sort of inherently political, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's about it's about taking back, you know, control and giving yourself the freedom to do what you want to do, yeah. you know, in the in the world, and whether whether you're here in the United States or whether you're in Latin America or Africa, wherever, right? Um, and um, but it's also fundamentally technological, right? Yeah. We have to win if we're going to decentralize the internet and, you know, accomplish this goal that I think we all share, you know, we have to have technology that's competitive um, and, and, you know, kind of circle back to something you were talking about a minute ago, like, and uh, Spencer was talking about the, the competitive advantage of being able to use the network for capitalization and to market the product, I think is going to be a, a differentiator for, global for cloud this X, yeah. you know, in, in the market space in a way that's, that's completely unique. And it's very, I, I'm really excited. To be well, and, and that's why that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? The, the big difference between great, these guys have been out there for a decade. They built all this infrastructure based on a different business model, but they saw where the, the future was. They saw what was coming next. And now you can see meta and all these other guys are seeing where the future is. It's AI. And so they're already doing these orders with what, a 24 month lead time, two years, you know, before they can even stand up or light up any of these 
potential things. So what, what I want people to understand is that the actual opportunity that we have when you purchase a CloudX hardware, let's call it pack for right now, you know, I know that there's going to be different levels and specifications and all that as we build it out, but you are owning the hardware mm -hmm. that is going to be, and let's talk about like some of the technical terms of in the cloud business, like tenants, right? Yeah. Like your, your hardware will be rented out to tenants, could be the average person hosting a website. It could be, you know, app developers. It could be enterprise level, you know, companies that are going on your machines. But let's talk about how does like the billing work for that, right? Because I know like for my my friends that are listening to this, they're they're really, they understand cryptocurrency mining, right? So mm -hmm. let's talk, take Bitcoin, you know, proof of work. Well, you buy an ant miner, right? You buy this machine, you plug it into this pool, and then it starts hashing and it generates you some, you know, BTC and then whatever that's worth in the market as far as dollars. In the cloud business or in data servers, you have hardware that runs, but... It's pulled together. But nobody, right? but the, at a point too, there could be nobody on your machine where sure. you're not, so you're not making anything per se at that point. But then what's the upside potential as well? In, yeah, in so, comparison? I mean, Nash can go into... Definitely more specifics than I can here, but I would say, you know, at a high level, very simplistically, there are a few different ways that cloud services make business or make make revenue. And and I'm gonna distinguish between like all the various feature sets that you might see on an Amazon or an Azure or something like that. But it's compute, right? Say you've got a, a web application or a mobile application and it needs to be able to run. That's usually charged based upon, you know, based upon the type of machine that you need that's sufficient for that, you know, computation or that compute cycle. You're charged by, by the period. It might be an hour or, or whatever, right? And then you've got storage because let's say you've got an Instagram. People want to put pictures up there or videos up there. That data has to be stored somewhere. And so in order to maintain that database or that storage of all of those different types of data, you pay to basically have a storage locker, the same as if you're, you know, renting a, a public, you know, a storage unit that's down the street and it's got a lock on it, right? Um, it's just virtualized here. We're just in the cloud. And then the other one is is bandwidth, right? In order to send and move that data to places, right? You know, the internet is like the highway system, but it, it costs money to move traffic across the highway. And so that's the other way that that we make revenue. And so while it, it's probably, you know, um, not an easy explanation to say exactly how and when everyone makes revenue on what different type, um, those are probably three big buckets that are that are very typical mm -hmm. and based upon usage. And again, the community advantage of being able to be out there and telling people about CloudX, right? If you've got 100,000 people or 10,000 people or whatever in your community, that's a huge advantage that each of these folks is is going out and utilizing for the CloudX business. You know, Amazon and Google, they they pay millions and millions and billions of dollars for people to be out marketing, and then they market on Facebook, and then they market everywhere, and then they put ads at the Super Bowl, and yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. they're spending so much money to market these services, and a lot of that, the community has a competitive advantage because. It's really you're you're motivated as an owner participant, right? Um, for that infrastructure to go out and talk about these services, one because it is a benefit. It, it's something that has real purpose behind it um, from this perspective of decentralization and not having to have centralized control. Um, but it's also something that benefits you personally by allowing others to come into a community and to drive revenue to a community that you get to participate in. Yeah, and there's there's huge opportunity to uh, and huge demand, and it's it's um, it's sort of easy to forget how much compute everyone uses, and it, and you you know we were talking about this on Monday, right? You you know you brought up your own AWS bill for your projects, mm -hmm. right? And and I was just looking through it, and and it's like um, you're not you're not even a tech company. Right. And and you've just got all this stuff that's deployed out there in AWS. It's costing, you know, um, thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And, um, 
you know, every company is like that, right? It's, you know, I'll, I'll, Google is running a program for startups right now where, uh, you know, if you're a startup and you qualify, you can go to them and they'll give you $100,000 of compute for free, right, to get you started. So, you know, a startup starts out and they they aren't really using very much because they're like working on their software. They don't have any users, but then they get their first hundred users and all of a sudden they start billing a little bit more right now. It's also still free, right? It's it creeps like, up. <laughs> yeah. But, but the zeros start getting added to the number of users for that startup. And all of a sudden they look down and their compute bill is $50,000 a month. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and now uh, Google's got them captured. Right, they're in the Google infrastructure. Everything is built on Google. They would have to spend a ton of time and energy to migrate to something else, um, but they're also paying through the nose for for those services. Um, and that this works to your advantage in a lot of ways. First of all, customers that come in are going to stay with you as long as the service is competitive. But there's also huge amounts of potential revenue because there are millions and millions of corporations out there that need to spend two, three, five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars a month on their compute workloads, whether it's websites, whether it's databases. Databases are probably honestly the biggest single <laughs> workload for most enterprises, right? Um, they're paying to store data and no one ever deletes anything. So the storage will just storage use will just grow forever, right? And, uh, and that, I mean, if you have a hundred thousand people in the network, right. And the servers that we spec for you, um, last night are 32 core machines, right. That's, that's 3.2 million cores, right. That's a lot of, like, there is a lot of, we can help a lot of businesses, right. Get on the cloud at a price that maybe is more competitive, um, and do so in a way where, you know, maybe maybe they buy their own servers yeah. so that they're actually earning money yeah. too, right? And th yeah, like if you buy a server, you might not get 100% utilization overnight, right? Sometimes it takes a while for a data center to fill up, right? Because maybe you, you, you buy in, when, maybe we'll open a data center in San Francisco and it takes a few months for us to find customers that want to host stuff there. Um, but the target, you know, utilization for um, for cores in the cloud is somewhere between three hundred percent and seven hundred percent, which means you're selling. You know, if you had three point two million cores and you sold them five times, you're selling fifteen million cores. Mm -hmm. right? these, these numbers get very, very large, very rapidly. Is because everything we do is mediated by digital technology these days, and and the 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 exponents are there to support all of this because we keep using more and more and more of it. Um, and being able to put people in the position to participate in that at the grassroots level uh, will, will really um, create the opportunity to build something really big and really special here. Yeah, and I, I see we have the opportunity, yes, you have the opportunity to empower people all the way down to what I call the bottom line, the, like your Africa's and your Latin America's, your India's of the world. Um, but at the same time, you just mentioned like a small business owner, like yeah. myself, I'm spending six figures minimum yeah. just on, yeah. you know, some hosting services and servers that I need to have to run my business. And then all of the media these days, the pixels are just, the resolutions are just getting bigger and bigger. So the <laughs> file sizes are just getting bigger and bigger. And I used to remember how hard it was to transfer just one gigabit file, media, you know, file. And Colby's over here looking at... I just airdropped him an eight gig thing and I, we didn't even, the computers didn't even have to like, it's like the craziest thing, but those files are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and people are, you know, there's no more hard disks anymore. Everyone's streaming and it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the opportunity, the demand is there. If, you know, you open up a data center and I'm not saying it's easy. There's a lot of cost and a lot of things that go into it, but the demand is there. The it's opportunity, not that it's easy, but it's not magic, right? It's yeah, yeah. well understood. Yeah, that's that's right. kind of the, the one of the great things about what you've asked us to do is like, um, I've 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 been on the SRE team at Google. I've deployed, you know, services to one hundred and fifty thousand machines. I've been on the Oracle Cloud team. I've seen in cloud bare metal clouds being built from the ground up, right? 
Spencer has been there to build the power infrastructure, do the data center projects. Like we've we've seen and done all this before. Like there's there's nothing that we are going to do for you that's going to be something um, that is uh, uh, that that's that that's hasn't magic. been done before. We have we don't have to yeah. invent anything on yeah. that side. Yeah. The beauty of it is you bring a really innovative marketing and sales approach to the project that um, that nobody else has, yeah. right? And and it's that. So that's it's very powerful, and th- thank you for saying that. And I I appreciate that. I want the he- people to hear that. Right, we're just going out there and doing something that's all, that everybody else is doing. And I'll say Amazon, Google, you know, the big boys are doing. We're just innovating it a little bit in in the marketing and sales channels and the way we compensate people or the, and the way that the profits are distributed. Um, so it's not like in the blockchain space where there's so much innovation that the regulations are unclear right now. Right. And we can, and Spencer, and you can maybe talk to this, give a little bit of what, like, we're not doing anything outside of any lanes here. And we're going to stay in our, you know, we're going to stay in our lanes. We're going to stay compliant. And we're going to, that's going to be our number one thing because we want to build something that can stand the test of time. And yes, right now it's innovative in the way we're going to do some things, but the business is well defined. Data centers are well defined. Powers, you know, there, it's it's a science, if you will, at this point. It's yeah. and there's no innovation of, well, maybe this regulator is going to come after I, me. I would say that I would say you know it, it's partly your competitive advantage and and also partly what makes this unique. So bringing the community and the network to bear with this is something that is unique. It's not to say that it's non-compliant. But it isn't something that has traditionally been done, mm-hmm. um, and it will enable you um, to to do things that those others couldn't do, right? And they couldn't scale in the same way or this, with the same velocity. The other side of this is, and you know, talking about compliance. So I'll, I'll give an analogy, right? What we're doing is like developing a large apartment building, mm-hmm. right? Let's say. We, uh, instead of it being an apartment building, it's a large building full of condominiums, right? Condominiums can be owned by individuals independent of whoever developed that larger building, right? Mm -hmm. They sign a purchase agreement, and then um, let's say, for example, it's what's called a condo hotel. And um, we work with someone, we put a flag on it, it may say Cloud X, it it may say Waldorf Astoria, it may say the Four Seasons, right? And there's a property management group in most condo hotels. This is very typical practice. The property manager is um, may or may not be the same as the developer and is certainly not always the owner group. But that property manager is in charge of maintenance, operations, promotions, all of those things. And the condo owners, while they may be able to stay there for some period of time or use that for their own purposes as well, Um, they allow for that space or that asset to be rented out so that it's a revenue-generating asset. That is exactly what we are doing here, right? Well, with the exception that you can only rent a condo to one person at a time. That's the (laughs) thing, too. It's crazy. (laughs) Yes, right? Sorry. But you can over-provision virtual machines. Ours is a little bit better. (laughs) Way better. It's it's five times better. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, guys, I know, you know, we went through a lot there. Uh, We'll probably do some more of these, and we'll probably get better and better at them as I learn the business and I can ask the right questions. But, you know, I want to say, number one, thank you guys for, you know, seeing the vision, I guess. And and I know I think each one of us are here because we see, like, there's something that we could do to, yes, make money is one thing, but it's always like, how could I leave this place a better world for my kids? And you guys listening may or may not know this my wife's from peru so that's why i always talk about latin america a lot and i I know how it is down there we've been in these trenches like with these people and it's like it's it's eye-opening the luxuries that we have just waking up in the morning and having the lights turn on having internet having running water you know people around the world don't have that and that's really can we go and build something and i use this term build something to give it away Right, but we give it away to where we can empower people, we can teach people, and we can impact people's lives. So this is a vehicle just to be able to do that, and it's a very profitable sector in the technology space, from what I've learned from you guys. Um, and so I want to thank you guys for all of the 
you know, time that we spent together, because believe me, I learn so much every time. And it's like, man, sometimes it's over my head. And I have to come back and call Spencer again. Did I understand that right? Is this right? The next time we met. And so, and, and even on the software side, Nash, like I, I try to absorb it all. I don't know enough about it, what you guys do, but I just want to say I appreciate you guys. I know over time you guys will probably get to meet our community and you guys are going to be the rock stars of that that put this together for us. So thank you guys. And um, I can't wait to have you guys back on. Uh, yeah. Can't wait. It's exciting. Thanks for having me.